Hey, chemists and biochemists, I wanted to use this video to talk to you today about amino acids and specifically talk to you about protein, or sorry, uh, proteinogenic amino acids. Now, where we're going to go with this is we're going to start out very, very generally. So proteinogenic amino acids, which I'm just going to leave shorthand as AA. Okay, so proteinogenic amino acids, this is a unique class of molecules that are used in the synthesis of proteins. Now, an amino acid is basically any sort of molecule that has the following groups, a carboxylic acid and an amine. So generally, whatever, or whenever we look at a protein or a polypeptide, we read them in a specific directionality from the N termini to the C termini. So our sequence that we look at is N to C. Now, I always like to draw the backbone of an amino acid the exact same way. I always start out by drawing it at a pH of one. Okay, so what I've got right now is I have my amine, my N terminal, my middle carbon, and then my carboxylic, my carbon that acts as, that has my carboxylic acid. So I'm gonna start on the right-hand side of my molecule where my carboxylic acid is, and I'm gonna draw that functional group at a pH of one. Okay, so if we look at this carbon right here, well, it has a, single bond going back to a carbon, it has a double bond going to an oxygen, and then another single bond going to an OH group. So that carbon is completely happy. It has four bonds to it. Octet is satisfied, okay? Now, if we look at the carbon to the left of that, this is commonly known as our alpha carbon, okay? Now, every single proteinogenic amino acid is going to have that alpha carbon. That alpha carbon has a total of four bonds coming from it. It has the one going to our carboxylic acid, one going to our amine, one going to a single hydrogen. And then where there's variation in our proteinogenic amino acids is this alpha carbon has one more bond going to which a group that I'm just going to label as my R group. That R group can vary tremendously. It can be, you know, a single hydrogen, it could have a carboxylic acid, any number of different things. And that's what makes proteinogenic amino acids different from one another, this R group right here. Okay, now back to our backbone. The N termini, the far left-hand side of the molecule is going to be, is an amine, and that is going to exist as a protonated amine, the way that I've drawn it right here, or depending on the pH, a deprotonated amine. Now, if you look at this molecule right here, everywhere that you could put a proton, there's a proton. This, which I'm gonna change the color for highlighting these or to, to identify these, these are the only two groups that as the molecule is drawn, you know, basically ignoring this R group for a moment, the C termini and the N termini, those are the only two groups that are variable. This carboxylic acid, when it's deprotonated, it looks a little bit like this, okay? When you've taken off as many protons as you possibly can, it's gonna look like that. So this carboxylic acid is going to vary between a charge of nothing and a charge of minus one, okay? Now let's look at our amine. The way that I've drawn it is the way that it will be shown at a, a lower pH. So a acidic pH or a more acidic pH. Now this is going to vary between NH3, as I'm drawing right now, and NH2, that nitrogen is going to have a lone pair of electrons on it. So what we have when we talk about an amine is something that varies between zero charge or some that has a zero charge and a plus one charge. Okay, so it's important to understand those two groups and how they vary in structure as well as how they vary in charge and the relationships between the structure and the charge that they, they bring to the table. Now, what's always important to think about is I've been mentioning pH. So at a low pH, this is what it's drawn as, or this is the way that it's depicted. Like I said a, a little while ago, I will always draw my amino acids at a pH of one. Now, how do I know whenever something is going to change from being protonated to being deprotonated? Well, I know that because each functional group is going to have a pKa, basically a measure of the strength of that acid. 
So just as my carboxylic acid has a pKa, my amine is going to have a, a pKa. Now, what I can always operate under is if my pH, if the pH of my solution is less than the pKa, then the group in question, so whether that's the amine or the carboxylic acid, is going to be protonated. Okay. If you just leave that, if you keep that in mind, you're going to be in good shape. Therefore, the opposite is also true. So if pH is greater than pKa, well then the group group is deprotonated. All right. So if you keep those two things in mind, that's going to be very helpful for you. Now, the last kind of uh, qualifier of it is, well, if the pH is lower than pK and the pH is higher than pK, what about when the pH is equal to your pKa? Well, this requires you to think about a solution and requires you to think about what's happening in that beaker. Well, you don't have just one copy of this molecule. When the pH is equal to the pKa, you have an equal mixture of the protonated and deprotonated form of the molecule. Equal parts protonated, equal parts deprotonated. So imagine if you had only one or two copies of the molecule. When your pH is equal to a specific pKa, well, then you'd have one copy of the molecule that's protonated, one copy of it that's deprotonated. Now, with that in mind, like I said, I draw my molecules at a pH of 1, and then I adjust accordingly. The pKa is typically, for a carboxylic acid, somewhere in the neighborhood, or your pKa is in your carboxylic acid for your proteogenetic amino acids are generally about 2. The pKa's for your amines are generally at about probably 9 to 9.5. Now, they vary a little bit depending on what your R group is and everything else, but nine and two are pretty good numbers to stand by. Now with that in mind, at a pH of seven, so at a neutral pH, what you're going to have is a molecule that looks like this. And I'm not gonna draw a specific R group, I'm instead just gonna label it as R. You're gonna have an amine that is still protonated because pH of seven is less than a pKa of nine. A carboxylic acid you're gonna have with a negative charge. Okay, so when you have a solution, if, if you have a molecule, a, a diprotic amino acid, so two protons can be removed, well, one side of it's going to be positively charged, the other side of it's going to be negatively charged. And they can be that way just because they are different uh, functional groups with different acidic strengths. Now, this is also known as your Zwitter ionic form of the molecule, where you have both a positive charge and a negative charge simultaneously present. Now, that's the form whenever, what's the charge of that molecule? What's the net charge of that molecule? Zero, okay? So every single amino acid is going to have at least those two groups. As you watch in the other videos, there's tons of amino acids that have R groups that are protonated, that having, or that will have a negative charge and those that will have a positive charge. And then there are some that are basically neutral. Um, but every single amino acid follows this, or every single proteinogenic amino acid follows this general uh, process. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful and have a good one.